rejection of the truth, Jesus is Lord. God is a miracle, so we fire, burning away all false desires. Yeah, he's gonna burn it away. Hello, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the second book of Peter, or Second Peter. And we're going to talk about prophecies, end time prophecies. The problem is everybody has their opinions, their prophets, but Peter, he was inspired. And what he has to say is directly from God and we can be sure of it. So what did he have to say? Well, he started out this third and last chapter by talking about the prophets and the apostles of the past. Talking about those who wrote scripture, those who were guided by the Spirit to tell us how the end will happen. And he's telling that to these Christians who are going through some hard times, both from outside persecution, but from inside enemies, as we discover in 2 Peter. False teachers, wolves, who want to abuse them, who want to use them, and they've been, they've been warned for them. But Peter is mostly focused on just, just stay the course, right? Just persevere through all of it because God's coming back. And he's, he's going to deal now, as he's, he started with in the first three verses, scoffers, mockers, those who still to this day, when we tell them about that an end is coming, God will judge. They say, what are you talking about? You, you hyper-moralistic person. Your sky god's not going to do anything. He never did. Well, Peter talks about all of it in the few verses. Amazing, right? 2,000 years ago, nothing new under the sun because God already dealt with it, talked about it. So do we need modern messages from God? No, we don't. We need to understand what God already said. And that's what we're going to look at in verse 4 to 7, reminding ourselves that, like I said, it's a connection, a continuation of verse 1 to 3. He started to tell us about the mockers and scoffers that would come and ridicule the prophecies of the prophets and the apostles. And he's going to talk about that specific mocking. What did they say, these mockers, basically? So they mock, verse 1 to 3, what did they say in their mockery, 4 to 7. That's what we're going to look at. So he starts in verse 4. They will say, what is the promise of his coming for... Ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. So the first thing they do is they attack this idea of the promised coming. Which coming? Well, as we will see moving along, but as we're already seeing though from verse 1 to 3, it's the second coming of Christ. It's clearly referring to the coming in judgment because he's referring to the prophets and the apostles. And the prophets, when you read the Old Testament, they talk about a first coming in humility to sacrifice himself. But then in the second coming, in judgment, or what we call the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. And clearly at this moment, Peter is talking about that coming because the first one already happened. And like I said, as he moves along, he will make it clear he is talking about a coming in judgment. This they mock. This they ridicule. Now, the way he expresses it is kind of weird. He talks about the fathers fell asleep or died. Which fathers? Now, the Hebrews, of course, would consider Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But most of the churches Peter's addressing are mostly Gentiles with a few Jews. So, would they talk about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No, of course not. Most probably, what Peter is getting at here is he's paraphrasing a bit their mockery. He's talking about the fact that these people, either Jew or Gentiles, are saying our ancestors for hundreds and thousands of years have lived and had families and died, and there's been no judgment from God. And that's since the beginning. You know, it's, it's kind of new, this idea, this uh, hypothesis, this theory, actually, that the earth is millions of years old. Back in the day, they recognized that there was a beginning not too far ago. They could uh, search back their history and see it. And, and all civilizations had an idea of a beginning. Different, yes, but all had one. 
and life kept going wrong, they said. There's been no judgment. What are you talking about? You Christians warning us to repent because the time is coming for judgment. It's interesting that that was the message back then because nowadays it's more of a Jesus loves you sermon instead of God is coming in judgment. Repent. That's the message they had. And that's the message that was getting mocked. What coming judgment? Well, Peter then um, aims at that misunderstanding by, by verse 5 and 6. And we're going to read them together because they go together. And it says, For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. So take note of this idea that they already knew that. When you look at the ancient civilizations, from the Chinese to the Greeks to Mesopotamians and, and Romans and everybody, they all had a, a deluge in creation uh, narrative. Might very little bit, but the idea of a cataclysmic flood that struck the whole earth is in every uh, major um, civilization. It, it existed. It is, now it is mocked and ridiculed even though more and more scientific proof is shown that there was one and there was an ark and all that, um, back then, it, it was common knowledge. Like I said, the, even if they were pagans, even if they were Gentiles, even if they came from the Greek or Roman um, baggage, that there was a, a story of a deluge. Now, he, he talks about the fact that um, the the... Earth came out of the water, and then from the water, everything was destroyed. And we realized that in verse 5 and 6, he's pretty much covering six chapters of, of Genesis. In creation, Genesis chapter 1, we, we see uh, the earth, the drought came around coming out of the water, and the water above it, the, the heavens. And then we, we have the fall, and then we have Genesis 6, the way flood. So he covers all of that in just a few phrases. Of course, he's just pointing at the fact that um, by water life came and by water it was destroyed. The poetic nature of God, if you will. But he, he does say they deliberately overlook or cover up this fact. Like I said, they, they had legends. They had stories. They knew. And they uh, purposely deliberately covered it up, denied it, wanted to pretend it never happened like we're doing now. No matter how much fact may show up, no matter how much evidence there may be, people still want to say there is no God, there was no deluge, there was no this, we don't want to believe in that. Why? Because they don't want to face up that there's a coming judgment. And that's what Peter's getting at. They don't want to face it, but they can't escape it. Like verse 7 finally tells us, but by the same word, take note of that, the heavens and earth that now exists are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So here's Peter telling us, as there was a judgment before, there will be a judgment now. And he's talking about the fact that this time is going to be fire. Fire. Now, don't miss that he talks, uh, repeats himself by using this idea of stored up and being kept. Think of Romans 9, these vessels of dishonor who are being filled up for the, good, for the coming judgment. In other words, God uh, gives them up to their sins until they're filled to the brim and it's, it's, it's time to judge. It's time to punish. And there's constantly this message throughout the Bible that God does do that. He, he keeps people. He he gives them over to, he lets them like accumulate until the, 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 well, the vase is bubbling over, until the moment has come for this fire to come down, for the judgment to arrive. It is in God's sovereign plan because he says um, by the same word. He's bringing it back to the fact that out of nothing God created from his word, right? He spoke everything into existence. 
and it's going back to the fact that it's by the same word that judgment will come. In other words, um, it, it's not what men will do. It's not the devil's schemes. It is God in sovereign will who will um, decide and speak. It is over and judgment comes. Fire comes down. Paul kind of talks about this idea of the coming judgment in fire in 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Trying to encourage the Christians, he tells them, This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in other words, coming in judgment, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. So again, it's the same sin. Uh, repent, put believing in Christ did, uh, recognize his sacrifice as necessary because when he does come, it's fiery judgment. Same message from Peter and Paul. A judgment that will come when God says it is time. So what, do, so what do we take away from this text? Well, I would say it's the same thing that they were supposed to take away. First, they will be mockers. They will be people that will hear this, this message of judgment and of a God who rules and will say, we don't believe it. This is ridiculous. The earth keeps going. Evil keeps happening. Government's still happening. I mean, we had the, the um, Assyrians and the Babylonians and uh, then the Medes and the Perds and, and the Greeks and now it's the Romans. Great empires, ma amazing rulers, great power. No judgment. And, and people could say the same thing now. Look at what's going on. These dictators, these superpowers, these war. No judgment. They will be mockers. We're not supposed to be surprised by that. But second, it's everything's being kept, stored up by God's mighty providential hands. It is in his hands. It might seem like things are getting worse and worse. It might seem like the enemy schemes is working, but in reality, they're just being stored up. They're just being kept by the very hands of God. If, you, if you, you prefer, permitted to get to that level when God will say, it is enough. Judgment will not come. And that is our hope. It, our hope is that God is the one keeping it and God will be the one to put an end to it. God will come with that fiery judgment. And so as we hid in Christ to be delivered, the same way our brother Noah hid in the ark and when God said it is time, the flood started, everything drowned, and Noah, his family within the ark, rescued, protected through the judgment. So will we be in Christ? And we are therefore called to warn the people there is a judgment coming. Take it seriously. We do not know when and where, but what we do know is God is being merciful, He's being patient, therefore repent and believe. This good news of Jesus Christ. So we recognize the mockers, recognize God's sovereignty, and we preach the gospel in hope and faith. We shouldn't let ourselves get bogged down by all of this, but instead keep our focus upon our God. This is what He's been telling us would happen. So we stay focused on Him. With this said, let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you rule upon the earth. And as it says in, in Psalm 2, as the nations come together and rage against you and your people, you sit and you laugh. Everything has happened according to your good purposes and plan. You are preparing and accomplishing your work. And the day will come. The judgment will come. Lord, we pray for the people around us who do not know you who mock and ridicule, who don't understand, our families, our loved ones, our neighbors, our co-workers. Give the courage to speak the gospel to them, to recognize that they will be mocking and rejecting, but there is a judgment coming. 
that we're not to be surprised by that, but to keep preaching the good news, to keep pointing to Christ as the only hope, the ark in which they must hide for the coming judgment of God. Lord, help us to persevere against such difficult times and rejection and in opposition of looking to you the whole time through. Help us to be like Noah for a hundred years, building that ark through mockery, speaking judgment against the people, calling them to repent. The preacher of righteousness, as Peter tells us. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And brothers and sisters, be blessed. Yeah, he's calling you, he's warning you, what you gonna do?